Good afternoon and welcome to Black, Brown, and Blue, a historical discussion of policing in Houston, our first CPH lecture series event of the academic year and our very first virtual event ever. I'm Dr. Monica Perales, Associate Professor of History and Director of the Center for Public History at the University of Houston. Although we regret that we can't be with you in person, we are grateful that you have chosen to spend part of your day with us here. At CPH, our vision is to ignite an understanding of our diverse pasts by collaborating with and training historically minded students, practitioners, and the public through community driven programming and scholarship. One of the ways that we do that is through this lecture series, which provides a unique opportunity for scholars, professionals, community leaders, and others to consider humanities perspectives directly related to the decisions they make. Although historians study the past, we are keenly aware of our present moment. This past summer, we witnessed the global wave of protests against racial injustice and violence, sparked by the deaths of George Floyd, who was raised here in Houston's Third Ward, Breonna Taylor, and so many others. The struggle for justice continues and has deep roots in American history. We believe that history, and especially Houston's history, can offer us tools to help make sense of the world that we live in. In alignment with the larger efforts of the University and the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, the CPH Lecture Series will dedicate our programming this academic year to examining the roots of systemic racism in our society. Our monthly events this year will explore critical topics, including the history of voting rights, food access, environmental justice, health disparities, and legislative politics, to name a few topics. We hope that our lecture series events can facilitate opportunities for academic and public audiences to learn together and from one another, have fruitful conversations that balance the past and the present, and address current pressing issues with productive dialogue. Today's event is just one conversation, but we hope that it will help move us toward building a more just society. Today's event and all of our CPH lecture series events will be recorded and posted to our website. To learn more about CPH, please visit our website at uh.edu slash class slash CPH. We encourage you to add your questions to the chat box in the live stream at any time. These will be shared with our panelists in the Q&A portion of the event. This box is located on the right side of the Vimeo streaming frame. And now allow me to introduce our moderator. Dr. Christopher Haight received his PhD in history here at UH in 2016. He's a professor at Houston Community College, specializing in the history of grassroots activism, African-American history, LGBTQ history, and social movements in modern American history. His first book, The Silence is Killing Us, The Anti-Hate Crime Movement in Texas, is under contract with the University of Texas Press and will be out sometime next year. I turn the floor over to you now, Dr. Haight. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to first thank everybody for tuning in, and I'd also like to thank the Center for Public History for inviting me to moderate this exciting panel. And of course, thanks to each of our panelists for agreeing to offer their insights today. Speaking just for myself, I am more than a little bit starstruck in that these are scholars and activists who loom quite large in my own work. And so I'm beyond thrilled to hear what they have to say today. Uh, so I'd like to just take a brief moment to introduce each of our panelists. Uh, first of all, Dr. Dwight D. Watson is an uh, associate professor of history at Texas State University and the author of the book, Race and the Houston Police Department, 1930 to 1990, A Change Did Come. Uh, this is the book on the Houston Police Department and the struggle to reform policing in Houston. His specializations include African-American history and the civil rights movement. Dr. Brian Benkin is an associate professor of history and Latino studies and affiliate faculty for African and African American studies at Iowa State University. He is the author of the excellent book, Fighting Their Own Battles, Mexican Americans, African Americans, and the Struggle for Civil Rights in Texas. This book examines the dual and often separate Black and Mexican American freedom struggles in Texas and identifies the causes of black and brown disunity in the state. 
And finally, Dr. Guadalupe Quintanilla is an associate professor in the Department of Hispanic Studies at the University of Houston. Uh, she is the author of numerous pedagogical and education articles, as well as national communications manuals for law enforcement and emergency service professionals. Uh, so like uh, Dr. Perales was saying, uh, the title of today's panel indicates that this is a historical discussion about policing in Houston, but uh, and we're going to learn a lot from our panelists about that history, but I do think we would be remiss if we did not draw connections between that history and our present reality, in which we're still struggling both nationwide and here in Houston specifically with issues of systemic racism and violence in our policing. Uh, and I think this is especially true after events yesterday in Louisville. And so I'm now going to hand it over to each of our panelists to speak and the discussion to follow will try to draw some of those connections out. So without further ado, I would like to first turn it over to Dr. Watson to offer a few words of introduction. It's all yours, Dr. Watson. Thank you. I wanna thank Monica and the Center for Public History at the University of Houston, my alma mater. I wanna say hello to Brian, one of my former students. I also want to take just a few minutes to say to those who are despairing over the outcome of the investigation into the death of Breonna Taylor, please understand that it is not over yet. And that the way the law changes is through persistent effort and action. The police and American culture are the only group of people that we have to consult to reform. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, I would now like to hand it over to Dr. Quintanilla, uh, who will offer a few words. Here's of my life with different um, um, law enforcement groups. And um, I have worked with the Houston Police Department 45 years in teaching and precisely cross-cultural communication. And I have worked with um, drug enforcement, uh, secret service, uh, sheriff departments, uh, you name it, I have done it. And what I have learned out of those 45 years and what my experience has taught me is that 95%, um, 96% of uh, law enforcement personnel really want to do a good job. They want to help the, com the community. But we also have those who join the departments because they want a gun or they want authority or they simply want to push people around. So we have a few, but the majority in my experience really want to be helpful. So um, there's hope. Thank you, uh, Dr. Quintanilla. Uh, Dr. Binken, uh, I'll hand it over to you now. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Chris. I really appreciate uh, you doing this. And I'd also like to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to thank Monica Perales and Wes Jackson and Matthew Castillo and um, E. Harrison for all the work that they've done behind the scenes because without that work, obviously we wouldn't be here and they have just done a fantastic job of, of organizing and keeping us all informed and like what we're supposed to be doing and, and, uh, and, and all of that stuff. There's a ton of work that happens behind the scenes that I think, you know, we never get to see. Um, I also want to thank the uh, University of Houston and the Center for Public History, especially. It's incredibly flattering to be invited back to my alma mater uh, to, do a, to do a talk like this and to be involved in a panel with such distinguished um, um, guests. Um, and I, I just can't tell you how like tickled pink I was when I got the uh, the email from Monica asking me to to do this. And uh, you know, just a special shout out to to Dwight. Um, I took my Texas history class when I was an undergraduate at the University of Houston with an incredibly busy graduate student who was teaching the class. And he was incredibly busy because he was dissertating, and he was dissertating writer, writing a dissertation on the history of HPD. And obviously that person was Dwight Watson and the book came out later and he has a you know, long and distinguished career. So I suppose in so many different ways, you could say part of my love for Texas history, uh, you know, derived initially from Dwight Watson. Um, I would just like to open up, you know, really by, by maybe just kind of briefly kind of taking us back in time because 
one of the things that I like to emphasize in my work, my work basically is positioned around kind of two theories, if you will, or philosophies or, or modes of operation. Um, one is to understand what communities of color and, and in particular African American and Mexican American people um, do to combat what they see as injustices in American society. So in my first book, it was overcoming Jim Crow segregation and the protest and the civil rights movement that uh, that, that entailed. Um, but the other part is understanding the the uh, institutions, if you will, and the systems that operate. Um, and, and those are in many cases the systems that these groups are, um, are combating. And uh, as far as police is concerned, I'm working on a, a two book project right now that just looks at the Mexican American community and its relationships with law enforcement. And so part of what I want to acknowledge is that with Houston, um, when we take it back to the very beginning, HPD was initially founded, like the first police force in Houston was a, you know, a, a non-legal, like, a, like, an, a, like a, a group of men just decided they would be the, the police force and they called themselves the Citizen, Citizens Patrol. And we've lost most of the history of that group, but it's, it's likely that it was basically a, 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 like a slave patrol that was there to monitor um, black people. And, and I would say kind of secondarily, because the Mexican American population at that time was so small, but secondarily, the Mexican population. Um, and, and that, you know, when you understand that that's kind of the way HPD came into being, um, and you can kind of trace those roots back, you can start to understand what we mean when we talk about institutional racism. Um, it's not necessarily pointing the finger at one particular officer, but it's understanding the way a, a group like police operate in a system that is historically and institutionally racist. And the last thing I'd like to say is we're going to be focusing on Houston. I think a lot of our comments will be about HPD, but I, I do want to emphasize Houston has this incredibly complex overlapping system of law enforcement from the Harris County Sheriff's Department to the consta uh, you know the different constabularies to Metro Police to you know kind of fill in the blank. So there there are just a ton of different ways we could look at law enforcement in Houston and I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Benkin. Uh, that's actually a really good transition, I think, into our discussion. So I'd, I'd like to just dive right into discussion if that's okay. Um, and I would like to start with that history um, and talk a little bit more about that history of Houston specifically. So all of our panelists here have written pretty extensively about the history or worked uh, in the area of policing reform in Houston. And if you look at the 1990s, uh, Houston was held up as kind of a model of effective policing reform. Uh, the, the subtitle of Dr. Watson's great book is A Change Did Come, and a change really did come in Houston in a lot of ways. But today, uh, if anybody pays attention to uh, Houston media, you know, today we are in the midst of another push for reform in the aftermath of the shooting of Nicolas Chavez. And so I guess my question is, how did we get here? How did we get to this point in your view? Uh, what went right in the 90s and what went wrong in the years to follow? And uh, uh, I guess we could start with Dr. Watson since Dr. Watson wrote the book on the Houston Police Department. I think we're gonna have to go back to come forward. Much of what we see in modern policing has historical antecedents. Uh, the 1930s, Houston was a changing city. It was battling the forces of growth, uh, massive immigration, unlike other southern cities. It was having an influx rather than an outward flow of migrants into the city. And it was grappling with the idea of gangsterism. And the police response to the idea of these changes was to arm itself and to, to gain what they call firepower to control um, gangsters, thugs, and moonshiners in the city. And it is clear from those actions that modern police, when put upon by a changing set of variables, have resort back to these old practices of arming themselves uh, shooting first and asking questions later. And what I found in these incidents that in many cases, it was not about the idea that we 
uh, were afraid for our life as much as we were concerned about a loss of authority and loss of power. And so we must ask ourselves in American society now, based on the historical record, when do we redefine the use of deadly force in American society? Uh, police, 1930s, police, 1940s, police, 1950s, used deadly force with impunity. And deadly force now is being used by police who use the Graham versus Connor affirmed the uh, case the, uh, principle uh, that they were fearing for their life as a justification for, for shooting. And so we get here by what I call an evolution of fear on the part of those who are to serve and protect. But my question is, if you're scared, why are you doing the job? Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Watson. Uh, Dr. Quintanilla, did you have anything to add? Well, during the 1990s, uh, um, it all depends on the priorities that the chiefs of police have. They have so many issues, and the issues change so fast. It depends on what do they consider priority. Some consider priority training, um, uh, investigation. In the 90s, the priority was community relations. That's what the priority was. And there was an all-out effort at the academy with the cadets, in the community with the officers on the streets. There were policing programs dedicated specifically to communicating with the community members. So that was very helpful during the 90s. Things change depending upon what ch chiefs come in and what the priorities are. But at the time, we had programs for the cadets. We had very strict uh, vetting for uh, applicants to the academy to begin with. And then we had the, uh, um, the classes at the academy, and we had the classes for in-service training people. And the police chief and the command were required to come to the opening of the classes and were required to come to the graduations to show the community that it was important to be able to, to understand how to work better and serve better. And so all of that has changed. We don't have anything anymore that I, that I, that I can say uh, is as important as it was. So we have lost the touch. We have lost the touch with the community pretty much. And uh, Chief Acevedo is trying very hard, but it's not the priority at this point. So just to follow up, you uh, are, are saying that the main cause you think is the lack of ties yes. to the community that the police now yes. have. And it is not only um, the officers understanding the cultural differences with the, the people with whom they deal, but it is also the community members not understanding the police culture. And there's a lot of misunderstanding on both sides. A lot of things that uh, should not cause problems cause them. In the Hispanic community, for example, when they ask somebody, um, ¿Cómo se llama? What is your name? Or, dame tu último nombre, which means give me your last name. Well, most people come back with Lopez, even though Garcia may be the, the official last name. Hispanics have two complete last names. And when they ask for the last name, they give the last one in the series, but that's not the official one. The official one is the next to the name. So all of these little details, and then the officers get angry because they, they assume they're giving, the, 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 the people are giving them the false name. They're not doing it purposely. They're responding to the question, give me your last name. And they give the last name of the series, but that's not the correct one. That's not the legal one that the officer wants. So there, there are all kinds of little details like that that cause problems, and the officers get angry. There is no way to ask a question in the Hispanic world um, except for the tone. In English, we have the do and the does. Do you have a license? The do says it. But in Spanish, tiene licencia. Tiene licencia? 
The second one is the question. The words are exactly the same. And when the officer tells the Hispanic, usted tiene licencia, the Hispanic is hearing, you have a license, and they say, oh, I do? They need to make it sound like a question. And the same with the African-American community. There are cultural differences that are so essential that cause a lot of problems for something so silly. And it's so crucial to be able to understand. And also understanding police culture is very important for many members of, for most members of the Hispanic and African-American communities, all communities to understand uh, police culture as well. So we need, we need specific programs to do that, in my opinion. Dr. Watson, did you want to uh, Yeah, uh, one of the things I, I will want to suggest is that there needs to be a sincere discussion about police culture. What is police culture? How yeah. do police operate? How yeah. do police think? Dr. Kensania really brought it out, but she also brought out a real valid point. Each police chief from 1930 till now imposes his or her set of operating orders on the force. From 1980 up through 1990, there was a consistent set of yeah. rules that yeah. the police department would act in a, a more collegial, more uh, way with citizens. Yes, Chief Irwin and Chief Bales. That's absolutely. You had from, from Brown forward, you saw this. But when Brown first got in the office, there was a, a, a resistance to anything he did, particularly the idea of community policing, because it would fundamentally alter police. Uh, police customs and police procedures. Yes. Police officers were not from most urban areas and they really were hesitant to think about going into communities, walking the beat, or even making or building relationships through interpersonal communications. And to this day, we still have a major problem uh, in many cities as to the police being outsiders in communities that they serve. And as a result of that, there is a lack of communication and a lack of understanding. You got to want to understand people to understand them. I've worked in law enforcement for a long time. And the one thing you have to understand and you have to employ is a set of empathy. And what I have seen of late is that there is a lack of empathy, not only in the police, but in other institutional entities in the country. Thank you. I do have a follow-up question for Dr. Watson, but first, uh, Dr. Binkin, I'd like to get you in on this question. Yes, well, um, you know, both Dr. Quintanilla and Dr. Watson have done a great job of, of, of framing this question and, and, and fleshing it out. Um, I, you know, I have, a, I have a different perspective, and so I'm going to kind of add and build, but also maybe say some things that are different. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is like any decade, if we're looking, if we're, if we're trying to measure out time and, and these sort of epochs, right, any decade is going to have ups and downs, pluses and minuses, positives and negatives, and the 1990s are no different. Um, but when I look at policing in Houston and I look at really policing across the Southwest, um, what I actually see is the beginning of where we're at now. Now, of course, we can take some of those beginnings back to the 60s and 70s, um, but, but the beginning, if you will, of where we're at now, you know, this, this is the decade of the Clinton crime bill. Um, this is the decade of a, a predecessor program from the Department of Justice that, um, um, that also augmented the number of police on the ground. Uh, this is the decade of, um, you know, where, where the war on drugs, for example, uh, took on a whole new, uh, a different meaning. This is a decade when, um, what am I missing? Oh, you know, when like the, the surplus military hardware stuff being sold to a police departments really, I mean, that goes way back to the 40s, but now, you know, the program as we know it today really expanded under, under George H.W. Bush and, and Bill Clinton. And so I, I think about that, and I think about the sort of massive flooding, if you will, of American cities with new police, and in many cases, new police that simply weren't, weren't needed. You know, we know that crime late rates had, had risen in the 70s and 80s, but by the late 80s, they were declining. That decline continued through the 90s, and of course, it, it continued up into the present day. We have some of the lowest crime rates in American history 
uh, you know, throughout the, the, the late 20th and into the early 21st century. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of different ways, this, this flooding of, of, of American cities with police anticipated a problem that wasn't there anymore. And the leaders knew it. Bob Lanier, who was mayor at the time, Sam Nuccia, who was the chief of police, they both said, you know, we've kind of done a good job. The crime is, you know, we've improved. It's gotten better. We're not sure we need all these folks. But, you know, uh, you know, administrators don't want to pass up dollars that will give them, you know, a way to look good and, and to hire people. And so that's what they did. Um, so, so there's that part of the 1990s. The community policing project actually came to an end in the 1990s because it didn't, it, it wasn't working and it wasn't having the effect that they uh, desired. Um, what I would say is if we're going to look at a decade that, that really mattered, right, we could, we could start with the 60s and 70s. You know, this is one of the things with HPD and with other police forces. It really does depend in some ways on, on who's in charge, you know, at the very top, but by the same token, you know, th that kind of leadership has to trickle down. So, you know, in the early 60s, you had somebody who was, I would say, like decently minded, like a decent minded law enforcement official in the form of Carl, Carl Shruptine, but he's replaced by a Herman Short. You know, we had this similar kind of thing happening in the 70s. And then in the 80s with Catherine Whitmire and Lee Brown, you know, Dr. Watson is, is totally correct that, that um, Lee Brown, you know, he, he got all kinds of pushbacks for the, the types of things that he wanted to do, but he got a lot of stuff done. And it's a lot of stuff that other police departments had already been doing for a, about a decade, police, a, police athletics leagues, uh, uh, community policing, storefront policing, you know, all of these other sort of things um, that, that, that they had been doing for, uh, for a while. And so I think that's the thing I see sometimes with Houston and especially with HPD, as a lot of times the, the, the department is reactionary. You know, um, um, Joe Campos Torres gets, gets murdered and then we get, um, um, then we get a, a, a division of internal affairs. You know, then we get conversations about uh, civilian review and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to parse out some of that, some of that stuff because I think it matters today. And what I've seen in my own research is a lot of times the reforms that are really, really beneficial. They seem really beneficial. They seem to work for a while. They get rolled back in times of economic stress or in other moments. And what ends up happening, I think this kind of goes back to what, what Dwight was saying, is, um, you know, then, then police forces fall back on what they have been doing before and, and those reform efforts get lost. And I think that's the thing that we have to, like, reform has to be kind of a constant conversation. How do we do this better? Because it's so so important, you know, we're talking about people's lives, we're talking about individuals with the power to take someone's life away from them. And when you sort of wrap it up into the whole criminal justice system and jails, and you know, incredibly important, it has to be done right. I think these are all really good points. And something that our panelists keep bringing up is this idea of community policing. Uh, and Dr. Watson's book, uh, Community Policing, is pretty prominent in that change part of the book, you know, the change that did come, a large part of that was the community policing model. And Dr. Quintanilla was just mentioning how community relations, community connections no longer seem to be there. And so I, I thought that it might be worthwhile for many of our viewers who are watching, if Dr. Watson wouldn't mind just giving a brief synopsis of how we get to that community policing model. Uh, what resulted, you know, what were the events that led up to that successful movement for policing reform in Houston? In the 1970s, a series of popularized uh, executions, in some cases it appeared, uh, by the police department and some other issues such as the shooting, Billy Keith Jovis and uh, Randy Webster, uh, leading up to the murder of Jose Campos Torres. Um, all of these things would lead up to a cry for police reforms, even the, um, um, what we call a minor riot in Moody Park, um, where, where Mexican Americans protested over the idea that the guys got such a light sentence in the killing of Jose Campos Torres, or maybe a two year suspended sentence or something like that. And what came was an election and that election created new coalitions and power coalitions and power politics in Houston. And they have an effect until now. You see, before that, there was not even 
a minority person or a woman, I don't think, on city council until Judson Robinson in 1971, a black man, won um, a citywide election. Then Barbara Jordan had filed a case, and the case would come um, to life uh, through um, a victory in court in 1980s when the 951 rule was approved by federal judge, ordered by the federal judge, that we'd have one strong uh, mayor manager form, we'd have five at large seats and nine single member district seats. And that's when Ernest McGowan and a large number of other um, minorities would come onto the force. And for the first time in history, the police department in Houston had to listen to desperate entities, voices from different people. And, and one of the champions of this was when she brought in an outsider, Lee Brown, who had a storied career. He, first of all, he had a PhD uh, in criminal justice law enforcement. He had been a sheriff. He had been, uh, he had been police chief in Atlanta, public safety commissioner. And uh, he was recognized as one of the, the deans of, of community policing, using the police as gentlemen in the community to advance the imperative of the department to try to reduce crime and to ensure citizens, all citizens, that they had a stake in the community and they also had, they were stakeholders in police service. Um, problem was <laughs> many of the people who were working at HPD at that time had been indoctrinated in an older system. Matter of fact, Herman Short, the what I call the Texas version of Bull Connors from the Birmingham police chief, um, Herman Short was a police chief's, uh, was a police officer's chief if you were white, if you were black, you were a pawn for him to use and find information on the black community if he could. But you could not expect from Herman Short um, assistance. But in 1973, right after Judson Robinson had won, Herman Short says that he is not going to, to sit at the table and negotiate with, quote, these Negro politicians and these Negro leaders in the city. And part of the rumor was that he, in 72, was considered to be FBI director. But the truth of the matter was Short's wife ultimately gets killed in a wreck. And Herman Short is despondent and he leaves the police department. And part of it was that I don't think he was sophisticated enough to deal with the changing political climate in the city. And because of that, instability mounted in the police department. Harry Cobwell, others came in. They didn't trust Harry Cobwell. They didn't like many of the police chiefs. Then they put a guy by the name of Carol Lynn. And Carol Lynn was, was essentially arrested and put in jail. Um, this was a real, real tough time from 1970 to 1973 up through 1982 when Whitmire and Brown came. The police officers themselves were ready for a change. Many of them were not ready for community policing because community policing was a, was a, had a, as a component, personal interactions, and a fundamental change in how you perceive and operate in the job. You are a public servant and your job is to serve all citizens, not police some and, and, and control others, but to serve all. And it was met with resistance and hostility in places. The other thing that came about was a raising of standards inside the police department. And officers who had been on the force a long time and through nepotism and other things had moved up in ranks, found themselves um, 
looking behind, looking at black officers jump over them, they thought. But the truth of the matter was these officers had always made higher on the service test than they did. There was internal prejudice on the part of many of the field training officers who attempted to rate them lower, which had a, a, uh, a greater impact on who became sergeant as a police officer. But Lee Brown comes in and he changes the rules. And one of the rules he changes is the amount of education that will be needed to become an HPD officer. And a high school diploma, then it goes up to 60 hours. And then they, at one point they were attempting to get it to 90 hours. And I think now I heard they have moved back to high school diplomas because it is getting harder to find police officers in a booming economy. And I'll stop there and, and let others answer. We said that wasn't gonna happen and it happened. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Watson. I think that is uh, really valuable. The history is really valuable for this discussion. And while we're on that subject of the history, uh, I think it would be good to bring Dr. Con Dr. Quintanilla in. And if you wouldn't mind just talking uh, briefly about uh, the cross-cultural communication uh, program uh, that you worked with, with the HPD. Yes. Uh but I wanted to make a comment. When I first moved to Houston, I came from a border city, Brownsville. And when I got to Houston, the first thing that I heard from my neighbors was, be careful with the boys. I have two boys um, because the chief of police is after the Mexicans. And it, that was for and short. It's after the Mexicans. And so you have to be very careful with the boys. Well, they scare me to death because of my boys. And then as I, I started meeting people in the community and met a lot of the young teenagers, and yes, many of them already had been in, in jail. And so what, what I did and met with other people in the community, what we did, we um, talked to Alfredo Hernandez, who was the first Mexican-American attorney in Houston, and met with um, uh, a couple of more of the attorneys at the time and they gave us cards. And then we met with the students in the different schools. We asked permission from the counselors to meet with the schools, uh, in, with the Mexican American students in the different schools. And we gave them cards of the, of the attorneys. And we told them, if you get stopped, you don't answer anything other than yes, sir, no, sir. Whatever they tell you, you do. You don't argue, you don't ask, why did you stop me? You go. But you have the right to one phone call and you called this number and we gave them the cards of the attorneys. And there was a complete movement all across because we were so concerned about teenagers. Um, the reputation was that an officer would stop a Mexican American teenager, reason or no reason, mostly no reason, and they would take him to jail and then the kids have a, a record. So there, there was the first thing that I knew when I got to Houston. So the reputation was pretty strong of, of the department at the time. And one of the reasons that I got so interested in, in uh, understanding police culture and working with the police department. And um, I started the program because I saw a group of people in Chicago who burned to death. Um, I saw it in the news. There were seven people in the third floor or fourth floor of, an, of a building that was burning. And the officers and firefighters were screaming there was a way out of the building, but the people upstairs did not speak English and the people downstairs did, did not speak Spanish. And that touched my heart. And so then the, the Jose Campos Torres case came and I wrote a letter to the, the police department and to the fire department and I offered my services to teach Spanish uh, so that uh, the communication was start coming. Um, the, the fire department never answered, but the police department did, uh, under, John, uh, under Harry Caldwell. And so I met with Harry, I met with Bales, I explained the program, and um, they had two or three other people who were interested. And so um, we started teaching, but I wanted the classes to be in the heart of the community. I wanted the classes at Ripley House and Feliz Fraga 
who was the director at the time of Ripley House, uh, offered me space at Ripley. And so we brought the officers to the community. I didn't want the classes in the, in the academy. I didn't want them in the police department. I wanted the classes at the community. And not only that, but then what I did, um, once we had the classes going and, and started, I started with 15 students who came in police cars and they were all concerned and their eggs, their cars were um, dirty when they left because community people would throw eggs at the cars. They didn't want them in the community. Nevertheless, they came. And um, I brought my, my children and my, my sons and my daughter and their friends to speak with the officers in the community hour. The classes were three hours, two hours were class, and the third one was community hour. And then once the, they, the officers started relaxing and speaking with these youngsters and kind of surprised that they're not causing problems, then uh, I started bringing uh, University of Houston students. And I started inviting community people. And gradually, community people started coming. And it was quite shocking. And I required that the officers wore uniforms. So the community person had to sit with the officer in uniform. And at first, it was very difficult to get them to sit together. But gradually, they started doing it. And then the department um, would send a photographer at my request. And then I would get the little photographs, put them in frames, and give them to community people with the officer and the community person uh, working together. And so um, we distribute those pictures all over the neighborhoods. Um, it started growing and we ended up having so many people. Sometimes we had 50 people coming uh, trying to help the officers teach. And we had people from 90 years old to five years of age. Children would come and they would teach numbers or colors or anything. Not teaching, but the idea was the togetherness in the community. And it was surprising to see how community people were shocked that the officers would sit and listen. And the officers were shocked that these people were not causing problems. What happens with the blue community, so many times uh, the community becomes blue, yes. And they don't have, they see minority people most of the time when they're causing problems or are in problems. And they don't, they don't have the, the necessary friendliness to, uh, to have many friends of a different ethnic group because they become blue. So the program was very successful. It lasted 45 years. Um, we took it all over the country, as I said, and uh, it worked very effectively because community relations with the Hispanic community really, really improved absolutely improved. Um, and it was a very successful program. It wasn't as much the language, although that was the entrance vehicle, but it was the culture, the understanding, and the, the, the dissemination of information about police officers and what they expect when they, they stop you in the street. Most Hispanics, and a lot of people, the first thing they do when they get stopped, they look for the driver's license. Well, the officer doesn't know they're looking for a gun. The officer doesn't have any idea. And so all of these things were very helpful, the, the way that, that it worked. Um, I think it was, it was a very, very successful public relations uh, program. We had officers who, um, we still have a group of officers who um, get uh, money together and they buy uh, toys for Hispanic children in the neighborhood and African-American children, by the way. And we have officers who play Santa Claus still. We had a lot of marriages between police officers and ladies in the community. Uh, I mean, it completely changed uh, the, the, um, the opinion on both sides. I have a stack of letters of people, uh, officers telling me, you know, before uh, I, I came to this program, I would, uh, if I got a report from my uh, Mexicano, I would put it at the bottom of the pile. I didn't want to deal with it. Now I try. So all, all those kinds of things really work well uh, at the time. Thank you, Dr. Kitania. You know, I think uh, talking about this really successful program uh, and just talking about the broader history, 
is a good segue into something else that I wanted to talk about uh, or something related that I wanted to talk about, which is, um, you know, when we look at the history of policing in Houston and the history of reform in Houston, are there any major lessons that you think can be drawn for other localities uh, struggling with their own systemic uh, policing problems? And then to add on to that, uh, are there any lessons from the past that Houston itself can draw from? Because as we've established, Houston is kind of back where it began. Uh, Dr. Binken, uh, could we start with you? Uh, yes, thank you. If, if it's okay, I would like to just briefly go back to the, to the previous question because I, I had some real quick thoughts that I wanted to make sure um, we get out. Uh, so the first thing that I want to say is community policing is an incredibly complex um, program, a constellation of ideas. Um, so some parts of community policing are things like, you know, like police athletic leagues, um, which are incredibly popular in many parts of the, of the country. Um, some parts of it are these usually police like storefront operations that a lot of times basically work like kind of like a social worker. So the police are there like on the ground in case there's crime, sure. Um, but they're also there like if a local resident needs a ride to the store or something like that. And to get to one of the points that, that, that uh, Dr. Watson said, like that's sometimes things that police officers just don't want to do. That's, that's not how they see their job culturally. And so you have to kind of find a unique set of officers to be able to do stuff like that. You know, com community policing can mean stuff like planting community gardens and, and, and helping folks with trash collection and, and pickup and stuff like that. And um, the point that I would make is Houston actually came to the idea of community policing really late. Most police departments started really focusing in on it in the 60s and implementing it in, in the 70s and, and Houston really didn't do that. Um, you know, they really, we really don't see community policing start again until, until Lee Brown. And I think part of the issue with that lateness is by the time we get to the 80s and into the early 90s, uh, community policing as a concept has really morphed into what we call broken windows policing today. And that's one of the more, um, I'm just gonna call it more problematic aspects of recent modern history because it positions police solely in the sense of, of, of fighting and investigating crime and, and, and nothing more than that. Um, you know, so we have this evolution basically from, from community policing to broken windows policing. The other thing I wanted to say, and this sort of gets, it gets back to some of the stuff that uh, Dr. Quintanilla was saying, is that a lot of times communities of color, a lot of times they look at this sort of stuff like establishing a storefront or police athletic leagues you know, they kind of look at it askance, but a lot of times they, they're the ones asking for it. It's, it's, it's not like it's unwelcomed. And, you know, I think, again, the problem is over time, either it morphs into something else or the thing that they like, the Police Athletic League, for example, that in many communities are incredibly successful. You know, you got, you got people in, uh, you know, I have examples from New Mexico, for example, where, where these athletic leagues, young people are basically winning state championships. And it's like, the talk of Albuquerque and other places like that. Um, we don't necessarily see exactly the same thing in, in Houston because because that concept um, um, comes uh, really late. Um, so I just wanted to add that that little maybe that little piece to contextualize some of what we're talking about. I do think it's important to try to understand like what members of the community want and what they're asking for, but also understand like what, how police respond to that and and you know the things that they can or are um, willing to do. Um, and now I'm jumping into that last question, Chris, I've kind of forgotten what your current question was. So if you could remind me of that and I'll try to be brief so the others have time to talk as well. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so my question was, are there any major lessons you think that, uh, that other localities who are struggling with their own policing problems can draw from the Houston history? Yeah, so um, I guess I would answer that in a, in, in a couple of different ways. So the one, as I said before, a lot of times HPD especially, and this is kind of similar for a lot of different police forces, but they tend to be more reactionary than they are proactive. And so I think that's a thing that any police department can look and, and, and try to do, like how can we be uh, proactive? So Dr. Quintanilla was talking about like some of the cultural sensitivity training. That was hugely important in the, in the 70s. It was things that uh, that was a thing that many departments started doing for existing officers. It was a thing they started doing for cadets. Houston basically starts a version of it in 1980 because of the 
the Joe Campos Torres case again. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a response to that when the demographics of the city had changed quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I would say, um, like, you know, with the Nicholas Chavez case, we've seen some really, there's still some ugly incidents that happen in, in, in Houston. Um, but I think in the form of, of Chief Acevedo, you know, we're, we're seeing someone who is, you know, much more transparent with the public, uh, much more willing, you know, the fact that he's willing to engage like the sort of gun 2A rights debates and, um, you know, and, and the fact that he fired those officers and, you know, some other things, it shows that he is maybe a more open-minded or even progressive police chief that we might see in other cities right now. So, so maybe part of what I want to do is just say, like, let's, let's talk about the things that, that we have in Houston that, that are, that are good and that, you know, that, that actually, um, uh, you know, have the potential perhaps to calm and ease some of the, uh, the, the, the tensions that we're seeing right now. Uh, thank you. Uh, those are really good points. Dr. Watson, you wrote the book on the Houston Police Department. Uh, so do you have uh, any lessons you think that other localities can draw from Houston? I have two good ones and one bad one. <laughs> the, the two good ones is that interaction with the community in a non-arrest capacity always works well for the police. The more the police reaches out to the community that they serve, all communities, not the one that they're comfortable with, it tends to work better because it impacts people at a personal level. Number two, violent on the violence on the part of police always lead to cries of reform and internal friction. And so if you can learn anything from the, from the Houston police of the 70s, you, we, you should learn that, uh, that, that violence as a strategic matter does not work well for police. And then one of the good things is that Houston has made a concerted effort to get educated professional police chiefs. And they've done this uh, going back uh, from Lee Brown forward and not saying that others 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 that others
and that when we start thinking about reform, we must stop working on sentiment of the of those to be reformed and come up with better ways to operate modern police forces. So I hope I uh, kind of gave you a, a better way of uh, approaching policing in the future. And that is that we, we work with police to one, raise their level of competence, two, uh, raise their level of interaction with the community and vis-a-vis -vis the same. But the other thing is to make them culpable and responsible for their actions. When you make people culpable and responsible for their actions, and they know it, they are, they are less likely to move toward aberrant behavior. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kitania, did you have anything you'd like to add? I think he said it well. He said it all. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, another question that I had, and this gets more to the modern day, you know, the current, I should say, movement to reform the police. Uh, in today's movement against police violence uh, that we've seen unfold over the summer and even before, uh, there's a real tension, I think, between those who advocate for reform of the police, we've talked a lot about reform, uh, versus those who advocate for much more systemic changes. We're seeing a lot more discussion of defunding the police. That, that alone has multiple definitions, uh, even um, abolition uh, to varying degrees. Uh, Dr. Quintanilla herself, I think it's a really interesting anecdote. Uh, in her work with the Cross-Cultural Communication Program, was angrily confronted by uh, Brown Berets, who accused her of helping the police. Uh, and I, th I think this tension is still with us today. And so uh, how is this tension managed in our recent history? And maybe more to the point, uh, uh, is there a balance to be struck to get today? Is there a reform that can work long-term or uh, is the answer much more radical than that? Uh, Dr. Uh, Binken, can we start with you? Yes, I'm happy to, to, to go there, I guess. Um, Okay, so it's a really big question and I'm not 100% sure where to start. I guess the first thing that I would say is um, a lot of times I think the concepts, for example, of defund the police, it, it rings, you know, badly in some people's ear and it, it's misunderstood. Um, one of the things that that idea means is not, you know, simply get taken away all the funding of the police. What it means is reallocating funds to do different things. Again, so the, the Nicolas Chavez case is a really good example of this, um, but let's be really honest, there have been examples of, of those kind of cases across the United States for, you know, forever, right? Um, the situation where you have somebody that's in the middle of a mental health crisis, uh, the police are called and then that person ends up dead. And, and, and so the, the thing that I wanna emphasize, first of all, is one of the things we can see historically is how police are used in a way that I would call like, you know, inappropriate or unfortunate. I've got some of the research in my, uh, in my current project, for example, on how police were used to fight the AIDS crisis. And, you know, it's a medical emergency and yet, but they're, they, you know, they treat it like a law enforcement issue. And so you have people that, that, uh, you know, they get gay men, for example, that get killed um, in, in really uh, atrocious uh, uh, examples. Um, obviously, the, the, the Nicolas Chavez case in Houston is the most recent one where you have officers that are called out um, and, you know, for someone that's in a mental health crisis. And I think the thing is, the, def the defund part means transfer that funding for those officers who would have gone there to mental health professionals or a crisis intervention team that can actually help the individual. Um, you know, I think it's sometimes unfair to, like the police, in that case, the police acted really inappropriately, but you know, it's sometimes unfair to blame the police for, for asking them to do a job that they're not equipped to do and then get mad when they act like police officers. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so, you know, I think those are the, those, when we talk about defunding the police, those are the kind of measures, um, you know, that I, I guess I would see as a, as a potential positive step 
you know, I think there's a lot of other ways we can look at this. I think, you know, some of the decarceration movement um, and changing, you know, crime uh, uh, sentences, for example, for uh, for drug laws and that sort of thing to kind of get people who don't really need to be in jail out of jail. Like there's another, you know, type of reform there that again gets into this broader criminal justice um, um, framework. And then the other thing that I would say and sort of pushing back on some of the uh, some of the other call it recent innovations I'm thinking in particular of like data driven policing and using artificial intelligence and thing of things of that nature. Um, you know, we've seen how that doesn't work. They tried it and, you know, believe it or not, they tried it in Europe now for about the past decade and, and it hasn't worked. Um, and it tends to over police again, the same people who are already over policed. And then of course that is represented again in, in incarceration and arrest and, and things of that nature. So, you know, things like that, I think, you know, we really need to work and think hard about. And, you know, there's other things like people will say, well, you know, if we just had more body cameras, you know, but I think that's a problem because like A, they don't work, B, police turn them off and C, what body, body cameras communicate is we don't trust the police. And, and I think that's the thing is like, policing is so important that we have to trust the people that are doing these jobs. And if we're not, that's again, pointing to a problem with the broader police culture in the institution and not the technology that, that may or may not be able to fix it. Uh, Dr. Quintanilla, I mentioned you in the question. Maybe I should have began with you because I mentioned you. Uh, but uh, do you have anything you'd like to add? Actually, no. Um, I, I just believe that uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, his comments were so appropriate because he's correct. Um, the officers are expected to deal with um, all kinds of circumstances that they're not prepared to do. Um, as much as they try to include and, and, and add hours to the training at the police academy, it, it's very difficult to anticipate everything that is going to be needed. And um, the, oh, many, of, many, many times the officers are faced with circumstances that they're not prepared to handle. They're not. Um, and we have um, terrible circumstances happening, happening for that reason. So, um, Unless we continue uh, expanding, uh, when we have a certain number of cases, then we need to add a section to the academy and add hours to the training, so the officers get a little bit better prepared to deal with uh, different cases. But the issue of dealing with uh, 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 people who uh, need help in uh, uh, mental health situations has been one around uh, the Houston Police Department um, for a long time. And we're still not prepared to deal with those cases as we can just just so res recently. So uh, as far as uh, police reform is concerned, we just need a lot more training ed and education in different circumstances to better serve. If we have expect if we expect the officers to serve all cases, is the only thing I can say. Uh, I th I th thank you, Dr. Kidney. I think we're running pretty low on time, but Dr. Watson, I'd like to get you in uh, really quickly, if you don't mind. Well, one thing I think we should think about is we cannot apply a short-term fix to a long-term problem. Police reform is a long-term problem. It is also a problem where um, we see that whenever you call for reform, it is personalized by the police themselves rather than seen as a benefit to police. Uh, for example, instead of having police be the primary call for mental health calls, you have a mental health caseload that goes out and the police are the last person to address that issue. Uh, Number two, when you talk about defunding the police, we shouldn't have to go to elaborate discussion with people who should understand that the police are doing a bunch of jobs they shouldn't be doing. The police are doing a bunch of jobs. They're not drug cops. They, they, they are police officers too to help with crime in the community. But then there is this problem under which um, there is this national mandate and this mandate is calling for law and order in a time in which 
I'm 100% certain it is not necessary because when you call for a law and order approach to society, then that's a no nonsense, aggressive approach on the part of the police officers. And so when people in high places speak down to the people um, in local offices, they give them a, essentially a green light to embrace quick measures to long-term problems. And policing is no, is, is a prime example because they use deadly force in many cases that in the past may have, may have been solved through negotiation. And so what I'm trying to say is the calls for reform are warranted. The calls for reform are essentially calls to change some, some issues and, and things that are related to the police. The police are seeing it as a personal attack, and that's part of police culture. The police internalize calls for reform as being saying that I'm doing something wrong or I'm doing something bad. Problem is one bad person reflects upon a whole force. You had eight people essentially uh, beating Jose Campos Torres, but the whole force got blamed for it. And so, um how does or uh, how will reform occur number one it's going to recur when the police officers or patrolmen's union realizes that it's not something they can negotiate that it is something that's going to be uh imposed from the outside they can negotiate a contract or hours but they cannot negotiate the ways in which policing will be improved or changed in the laws that govern them. Also, we can change the use of deadly force in American society. What are the rules of engagement? When can we use a pistol? When can we do certain aspects of it? For me, that's police reform. You see, but when they hear blanket reform, it's like somebody talking about your mama. You, you heard them talking about your mama, whether it was true or not, you're ready to fight. Police are ready to fight when you say reform the police. That's true. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you to Dr. Watson and uh, thank you to everybody. I, I really hate to cut this conversation short. There's so much more that I want to ask, but we, I think, need to transition to uh, right. Q&A from the audience. And so I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Prowlis now. Yes, thank you so much for this really enlightening conversation. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in and I hope we can get to as many of them as possible. Um, I'd like to start with this one question that was posed by Miles who asks, um, is it the responsibility of the people or the institutions that train the officers to change the culture that the panelists have been speaking about? It's a bifurcated process, both are responsible, but police are culpable because oftentimes we deal with police when excessive force is used, excessive violence uh, and vis-a-vis -vis death. And so um, both parties need to understand that there's a causal relationship between the two and there must become a clear line of communication. Thank you. Any of the other panelists wish to, to uh, uh, chime in on that question? I, I will if Dr. Quintanilla doesn't want to go. Okay, so I will follow um, Dwight and say both also. Um, but the thing that I would add to that is I would, I would say that the police actually have a little bit more um, call it responsibility in this area because they're the ones who have the power. Um, people have power in a lot of different ways, but, but the police have an immense amount of power. And so part of whatever reform we might be talking about or change or modification to policing, it has to somewhat be more on the police because part of what we're going to be talking about in those conversations is addressing the power that police have and potentially asking them to reduce the amount of power that they have, reduce perhaps the funding 
that they're going to get. And those, a lot of times for institutions, those, those kind of um, discussions are oftentimes really, really difficult and painful because I think we understand that once institutions get power, they're, they're pretty reluctant to give it up. Well, it's not just institutions, it's people in general, man. Nobody likes giving up what they got. But in this case, man, um, there is a, a vast shift in societal ideals. But then there's this narrow focus above all of us suggesting that the police should go back to what they call the old ways. And I argue that the old ways are not it. And when you remove away from them that blanket protection of qualified immunity, I think policing will change. Thank you. Another question we have is uh, for Dr. Quintanilla. Uh, Dr. Quintanilla, has anyone continued the work that you've done? And uh, is your legacy, is your program still operational um, and your legacy still? still alive? It was up until two years ago, and then um, budget constraints closed it. So no, we don't have it going anymore. And yes, it is going in different parts of the country. It is going in San Bernardino in California, for example. I know they continue to do it. So um, it has grown in different places. Uh, there's some uh, so many questions here. Uh, a question about the issue of race and class in law enforcement, and if maybe the um, I, I realize this is a, a huge question, uh, but maybe if the panelists might be able to speak a little bit about the relationship of questions of race and class in in policing and in law enforcement generally. Police see themselves as essentially middle class whether they came from a middle-class background or not. And that's the way they embrace and operate uh, middle-class values who serve primarily elites. And because they serve elites, they tend to have a kin to that group, an affinity to that group. And therefore, people who, who are beneath them are served rather than and controlled, rather than serviced or police or, or or given the same kinds of services. The other thing is you got to look at HPD was one of the only police forces in the South to have black police officers. And they only had Mexican police officers or people with Spanish surnames as police officers, uh, as special officers up until essentially the 60s. There were people who had Spanish surnames like Orlando and things of this nature, who I personally believe were Mexican people passing themselves off as Cuban or some other exotic uh, Latin name or something along those lines. Uh, but what we tend to see is that the police operate with a mindset that they are middle class to upper middle class and their values uh, are such. They also uh, see themselves as not part of the communities that they serve. And that creates tension. Yes. Say, for example, when they begin to increase the numbers of Blacks on the police force, they always had to increase it by two. So they had to have two Blacks in the training class. So they, they brought in a Black woman, which happens in the 50s. They had to have two Black women. And there's a reason for that. The reason is they didn't want Black folks wrestling with white folks in physical activity at the force. As a matter of fact, blacks could not even go into the cafeteria at the academy until the late 70s. And that was just a general rule that they would give you your food out the back door and you'd sit. And so uh, officers rebelled and said, no, in the late 50s, we're not going to do that. But they, they finally changed it in the early, mid-60s, and officers, they all would go in the cafeteria to eat. And see, this discrimination is inside the department. And see, I, t I worked in law enforcement, and one of the things I learned in law enforcement is that there is a separate code of policing inside the police department itself. And there's this kind of hierarchy, and the hierarchy is oftentimes based on 
how long you've been on the force, who trained you, and uh, who is handling your field training, and thus, thus your promotion ladder. Um, they did not increase numbers of minorities on the police force to be commensurate to the numbers until Herman Short made a public announcement about the reason there are no blacks on the police force because nobody applies. And when he made that claim, one of the former police officers, Jimmy Doxon, said he went and applied and got to be a police. He becomes chief at, at one point, or assistant chief at one point. So it's important to note that there are some real serious internal problems in the police department itself. Yes. Well, can I add one thing? Dr. Quintanilla, do you want to yeah. go, please? No, I just want to say something really fast that uh, the department uh, is still, uh, <laughs> for many, many years, we're talking about Mexicans. We're, mm -hmm. we still talk about Mexicans. But uh, the, the, the culture change in the Hispanic world. Mm -hmm. uh, for Mexicans, we started getting a lot of Salvadorians and Colombians and Venezuelans, and now we have every single um, uh, uh, member of the Hispanic world represented in, in, in Houston. But I think that's something that is very slowly being recognized by the department as well. And uh, I don't know that we have, uh, we have I'm not aware that we have hired as many representatives as we need uh, in the department as well. So I was just gonna follow up on, on um, what Dr. Watson and Dr. Quintanilla had, had said. Um, and I guess, I, you know, this is a race and class, right? Is this huge, <laughs> there's a lot to it. And I'm not sure the different direction that I would wanna go in, but what I would, what I would say is that, um, you know, I started off at the beginning to talk about, you know, how, uh, police force is, is institutional and how we can see systemic racism, you know, sort of over the long durée. And one of the things that happens, um, that we know happens is that in the 50s and 60s, in the 60s and 70s, I should say, part of what I'm going to argue in, in, in my current project is in fact these, these um, attempts to recruit non-white officers actually go back to like the the, the 20s and the, and the 30s. Um, but in the 60s and 70s, the point that I was going to make is that police departments started with, they, they usually term something along the lines of minority recruitment programs, right? And the whole idea is, look, we're having these issues with communities of color. Let's hire more police officers because if we have representation from the, from the police officers, right, then those people, let's say it's the Mexican American police officer who's involved in a situation where a Mexican origin person is being brutalized or treated improperly or whatever it might be, that that police officer will be able to understand and say, no, we need to stop. No, this is wrong. This person misunderstood. This person didn't understand. That thing you thought was aggression is not really aggression, whatever it might be. And I think what we've seen time and time again is that that hasn't worked. You can see it in the Nicolas Chavez case. I think the, three of the officers that shot him were, were Latinos, right? Um, and it doesn't work because it's not, you, first of all, it's not fair to put that on those individual officers. That's a huge burden and not fair to say like, well, we got some Latinos and they can fix everything now. Or we got some blacks and they're gonna make everything better. Like that, no, that's not really how it works. But the other thing is it's an institution, right? So they're acting as the institution. And so people oftentimes will say, like, why, why was it that there was a black guy that was involved in the shooting of that suspect? Or why was it in the Nicolas Chavez case that there were Latino officers? And that's the reason why, right? It's institutional racism, not individual racism. That's true. That is actually true that the department and institutions have their own reputations and much of their reputation um, in the community borders on how the community perceives them and how they act in certain communities. Brian, you brought up this broken, the broken windows. And this is real important to understand that certain communities are policed and certain communities are served. Those who are policed tend to have higher arrest rates. They tend to have more aggression toward them and a lot of that has to do with how police see that community based on internal bias 
that kind of filters through the culture of the department itself. And so how do you make, somebody asked the question, how do you make substantive change when you got to change who they are? Substantive change is a very slow process. Institutional change and a major entity can come immediately on the surface but deep down, it takes a while for it to kind of soak in. You can stop them shooting people, but you can't stop when them want to shoot people. <laughs> you see, that's eventually, they, they get a different set of skills. And I'm not trying to be facetious. I, I'm really trying to say that it is possible to reform police, but you've got to have police willing to buy in to that change. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, so many questions, um, and I'm seeing a couple of threads that are that are kind of uh, emerging here, and so I'm going to try to group them a little bit. Uh, so one is the question about practical um, ideas for reform. You know, um, you know, we've we've talked a little bit in this panel about education requirements. We've talked about uh, different community programs and, and ways of working with the police um, and, and communities. Um, but can the panel kind of speak a little bit about how, or even is it possible to reform police on a national level when we're talking about so many different localities? Um, you know, and, and what are the kinds of maybe um, pragmatic or very specific things that, that can be done? What are the kinds of things that activists and advocates can be, can be talking about and, and pushing for to see in, in policing reform? Things that have worked in the past, uh, things that we might have learned from experience in the past to bring, in, bring to bear on this question. Um, and I, I throw that out to whoever would like to jump in. Well, in. I read an article recently that talked about models of reform. And it says that the national model of policing doesn't work very well. It failed in France and other places like that. The British system tends to work better because it disincentivizes uh, members to, to be aggressive and other things like that. And it encourages them to seek uh, training within the organization to move up to gain certain positions uh, of certain status in the organization. So it, there's a buy-in. So what, tends, what has to happen is that the police will have to stop being a collective bargaining unit that uses their power and authority to protect aberrant behavior uses their power and authority not just to negotiate a better salary for themselves, but to negotiate how people can give them orders. Um, that's a, a very difficult thing to do when you are a public servant and you get to say how you're treated, even if your behavior is bad, you know? And so what we have to start doing is looking at a better way of, of creating a police mentality nationally that will ultimately filter down to various departments, large, particularly, it's got to start at the larger departments first, because smaller departments are going to, macro level departments are going to be harder to get to, but eventually it filters down because there'll be a standard of training in each academy and each, you see what I'm trying to get at, that you eventually have a set of rules that, that all police play by, much like the organization of police chiefs. And I, I didn't mention this, but this is important. Most police chiefs in America belong to the Association of Police Chiefs. And this goes back to the 30s and 40s where they, they almost without a doubt predict when social tensions are going to happen because they're the ones who are usually <laughs> on the other side of it. And for example, in 1960, they start talking about 
social change and how social change was going to be a problem. And so the police poised themselves for social change and they did it by getting themselves ready for an aggressive put down of, of social change. And if you look at laws passed at that time, they all address anti-riot, anti-marches, those kinds of things. And so it, they took a lead from the police chiefs that this is the way it goes. And so what we have to do is get police professionals at the table with other professionals and say, hey, this is what we gotta do. We gotta do the heavy lifting. And we wanna make a better police department and we wanna have better relationships with communities. So here's what we have to do. And this is what is at stake. And when you get the stakeholders to talk about what's at stake and what they'll lose versus what they gain, then you start to see some kind of action moving forward. Okay. Dr. Quintanilla, Dr. Rankin, any? Well, I agree. I think the key is the association. And if, they are, if the association buys into uh, a strong program uh, for that they can endorse for academies, for example, for better training for, for the, or in better recruitment for the cadets, better vetting, better recruitment, better training at the academy. If the association, the, the police chief association endorses the idea, then we may, we may have some reform nationwide. Well, I would add, um, and I know we just have a, a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll try to be very quick. Um, I would add, um, so first of all, uh, police departments operate locally. And so a lot of times change has to come locally, but those departments are bound by city, county, state, and federal um, rules and laws and ordinances and whatnot. And so there is this broader connection, if you will. It's not just all local, right? It's state level, it's national. The specific question, and I saw various uh, questions come in the chat as well, Monica, um, that, that focused on sort of national issues. And so if we're just talking national in my last few seconds, like my idea for national level reform would be something like a national level uniform use of force policy. My, uh, my, um, my, my suggestion for national level reform would be to remove programs like the war on drugs, get rid of the war on drugs, get rid of the war on crime. These things have not worked. Uh, they have never worked. They don't appear likely to work in the future. And what they've really done is over, over incarcerated, uh, you know, certain segments of our population, in particular, uh, people of color. And the last thing that I would say is um, get rid of the, the, the programs that allow military hardware to be sold to police forces, because not only do they not work, they allow police forces to operate basically like, like many militaries, giving them a power that I, I, I simply don't think that they need. But they do operate as a military force. I mean, it's their, part of their training. I, but there's a difference between operating as a military force and then having the tools and the arsenal to actually be able to do that. Thank you so much. Um, clearly, this is a really timely and important topic, one that we could spend um, many, many more hours talking about, such great questions in the, in the chat. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, for, for being here um, and to all of our panelists, Dr. Watson, Dr. Quintanilla, Dr. Benkin, thank you so much for your time. To our moderator, Dr. Haight, thank you for, um, for sort of facilitating such a wonderful conversation. Um, all of our participants uh, in, the, um, in the live stream, thank you for being a part of this truly important and insightful discussion. Um, I also want to uh, give a special thanks to our program manager, Wes Jackson, and to Iggy Harrison, Matthew Castillo, and the team at UH Streaming Media for all the behind the scenes magic uh, that it takes to, to make an event like this happen. Thank you so much for, for doing that for us. Um, the next event that is part of our CPH lecture series will be held on Wednesday, October 21st at 6 p.m. Uh, in collaboration with the UH College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences Special Committee on Race and Social Justice. Dr. Martha S. Jones, the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University, 
will give a lecture titled Vanguard, When Black Women Led the Fight for Voting Rights. Um, again, this recording uh, will be put up on our website. Um, and if you want to learn more about who we are and what we do, please visit the Center for Public History at uh.edu slash class slash CPH. Again, thank you so much for being a part of this event and take good care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.